get a new, you know, replace your sprinkler heads, right? This washing machine costs a thousand dollars. This gray water system costs seventy-five dollars, and will recycle your water into your garden, so you don't have to use that water anyways, right? But those things are disconnected in our mind. Laundry is not connected to fruit trees. That it just doesn't make sense to us. And we see the world as these tiny little pools where, you know, you drop a rock in this one and the ripple is only in your little pool. But the world is not a bunch of little pools. Okay? The world is the ocean. Ocean of connection. And when you drop your rock, every act you take causes a ripple over the whole ocean. It might be, you know, a thousand miles away, it might be a little ripple, but it's a ripple. And so we have to understand that this world is connected. And that when we make decisions, we have to understand the world is connected. When we, when we solve problems, we have to understand the world is connected. And you just see this, I mean, you see this everywhere. We, we solve one problem, we create another problem, right? And you just have to remember what Russell Crowe said. <laughs> Brothers, what we do in life echoes in eternity. I mean, this, this sign, when you see this sign on the freeway, like, what the hell does that mean? You know? Here we are driving on a freeway, which is probably built over a river, you know, which is just dehydrating the land. And, oh, thank you, government. This is what you got for me. You know? And at the same time, this is the LA River during a rain, right? All this water is just being ejected, 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 given no time. I mean, we're literally, we got all these water harvesting systems all over. We got gutters, you know, we have, we're, we've got contours directing water, but we're all directing it out. And, and this is just, I mean, this is just pure insanity, right? This is pure insanity. And this is, a result of una being unable to connect pieces together. And we plan for disasters like these, right? We plan for floods, we plan for earthquakes, we plan for volcanoes, but at the same time, we are creating natural disasters all over the place. We're creating parking lots, we're creating shopping malls, we're creating cities that are scars on the land. So we don't understand that you know, this culture has become a natural disaster. And we have to, you know, we, it's not about minimizing how much negativity we're doing now. Like now we have to actively focus on positive. You know, how do we, I, don't want, I, I want to stop like talking about why we shouldn't put in that parking lot and start talking about why we should take out all of the other parking lots. You know, I'm tired of talking to city people and being like, oh, but that land, you know, is going to turn into an apartment. So, oh, you can't stop that development. It just, this, is, this is just crazy. Like, we need to stop talking about actually starting to dismantle some of these things and break concrete, break asphalt. If you haven't broke concrete before, it's awesome. You should all do it. You know, get a jackhammer or get a sledgehammer or get a concrete saw and rip it up, and then you take it out, and wow, there's soil underneath, and you can plant a garden. And it's an amazing feeling, because we're starting to understand connection, and we're starting to see what you know, the reality is, the soil underneath us. You know, this expands beyond just gardening, and beyond the environment. I mean, our culture is just so disconnected, right? We see people like this, who are artists, trying to describe in a way that you can understand that this culture is oppressing them and that they live in an environment which is not conducive to their health and you call them thugs, right? 
while at the same time, the real thugs are sucking us dry, right? Sucking the sap out of our trees and, and destroying the ground beneath our feet. And we need to start pulling these connections together. So like I said, you know, I don't see natural and artificial anymore. I see, nat I see nature. And when we call it a concrete jungle, I believe that this is a concrete jungle. And you know, if, if you don't see this as an ecosystem, try walking out in the street and not getting run over by a tree while you know, running over by a car while birds are chirping and someone's yelling and singing at you. That's the same thing that happens in the jungle. <laughs> you know, it might be a lion instead of a tree, but or a car. It's the same. So, the city is an ecosystem, it's an unhealthy ecosystem, it's a disconnected ecosystem, but it is an ecosystem, and it's an ecosystem lacking true connection, where we're connected by freeways instead of by relationships. So, these are the questions I asked myself, and I didn't know that these were the questions that I, I, you know, we were asking when we started our organization, but after a few years, I've kind of gained some clarity, and and this is what I think about. So, what happens when we view the world as an interconnected, interdependent whole? What happens when we see ourselves as nature? What happens when we see people as creators and destroyers, actually, and but not consumers? I want to erase that word. What happens when we hold soil and water sacred? And what happens when we see resources not waste? So I hope uh, some of you came yesterday for the, uh, was it the, the ground beneath our feet panel? That was about composting, because that's, you know, that's like the entry point for the whole waste versus resources thing. And, and kind of more broadly, how do we think, act, and relate? in the culture of connection. So what is, if we're creating this new culture, um, what does it look like? And uh, so these are the questions that I ask myself and uh, my mom who works with me asks herself and my fiance, Arthi, this, this is what we're thinking about and this is what we're trying to do with our work. And, and like I said, I didn't understand all this when we started, but it was still there. And, and this is a, the first thing that we, we did as an organization was we worked on our home. Uh, this is a, a home that I grew up in and I've lived at all, mostly all of my life. Um, and it looked just like any other home for 20 years. Um, and and you know, the suburbs, I think, are the, are the perfect metaphor for the culture of disconnection because you got all these people living close together and no one talks to each other and you have these six foot concrete block walls between each other and you all drive you know, out to do everything and nothing happens in the home. Um, so we started to kind of undo the, or make this into a, an actual space where we would live rather than just sleep and watch TV. And, uh, and so this is what's happened over the next, over the next few years. So that was 2008, this is 2012. We removed all the lawn, we planted a bunch of fruit trees, um, and then this is 2015, and here's the uh, next one, the before and after. And, and this is our first project, we call it The Growing Home. Um, it's been at a bunch of news uh, media, and it was in a documentary called Urban Fruit. We got some posters for Urban Fruit, if you want to buy some afterward. Um, and this is where I, I, I began to understand these ideas, that that when we connect things together, they become healthier. You know, that when, when I am uh, taking care of the soil, and the soil is taking care of my plants, and I'm eating those plants, then that connection makes all of us healthier. And, and that it's really hard to say, like, I am the gardener, and this, is the gar and this is my garden. And it makes a lot more sense for me to say, like, I am the garden. And, you know, we are all, this is, this is the garden. I'm, I'm here representing my garden right now. Or as a walking extension of my garden. 
Uh, and just a, a little overview of the space. Um, we have 5,000 square feet of land there. Excellent. Um, we harvest all the rainwater. You know, Lee's been uh, my rainwater mentor for a number of years. So we harvest all the water and some of the water from our neighbors' rooftop as well. We use 50% less water than we used to when we had a lawn. And um, we have diverted over 50 tons of organic matter in our, just in our home garden. And we, view, we use that to grow about 4,000 pounds of food per year. And, and you know, these are things that we didn't understand were possible when we started the project. But just as those connections get woven tighter and tighter together, and as you make new connections outside and bring them in, the health of the place just kind of explodes. And so we're, we're beginning to understand things that we didn't know before. And, and this is where you can sum it up, right? That's the soil when we started. That's the soil. Well, actually, that's my neighbor's soil. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the, the soil today. And you can, I mean, you can literally just stick your hand right down into it, and it used to be as hard as a rock. So, uh, uh, two years ago, we kind of expanded our mission. We, we took all these understandings that we had gotten from the home garden. Uh, we started this organization called the Growing Club. And basically, what we're trying to do is, is uh, spread this awareness to other people and uh, we have people who support the work that we do. We do a lot of educational programs, we do workshops every month. Uh, we have our demonstration gardens, which I'll talk to you more, I'll show you in a second. Uh, and, and we have club members who, who donate to us monthly to support our work and keep what we, keep what we do going. So here's some of our workshops. Uh, we, this is a, a swale workshop right here, installing the rainwater harvesting feature. And your same workshop, we're just explaining how it all goes. But the, the thing I would actually, the reason I'm here to talk to you all today uh, is because we started a farmer training program and a CSA called Sarvodaya Farms. Sarvodaya is a term that uh, Gandhi coined during the Indian independence movement. And what it means is, is sarva, sarva means all and daya means rise. So the translation is the the upliftment of all. And, and so we're, we're trying to uh, bring people up, bring the soil up, bring the water table up, bring diversity up, and uh, do that through farming. And, and the, the, the reason that we started this was because um, kind of out, through some luck, we, we were able to get a hold of this half acre piece of property in Pomona. We have a, lease, a free lease on this property. We've been there since August 2014. Um, and when we got there, you can see it was just a, pretty much an empty piece of land. There were some fruit trees that had already been planted in the back. And we just started doing our process. So you know, here we are, identifying waste as a resource. We, we pulled in over a thousand cubic yards of organic matter in terms of tree trimmings, uh, horse stable manure. I think the next one gives you the manure picture. Yeah. We love poop. I mean, we're big poop fans. And that's, horse poop is like the number one poop we like. Um, so we, we, we're identifying, we literally look around and we, we don't see trash, right? We're just trying to see, we're seeing where are the resources that we can pull in. And not only do we not see trash, we don't, we don't see useless people, right? We don't see people who have no skills. We see people who are, who are needing a space to go. We see people who need something, to, you know, uh, a community to be involved with. They need a place to, where they can feel welcome and where they can feel productive. So, we, we're, you know, those same questions, I'm not just asking them about the soil, and, and urban farming can't be just about the soil. It's got to be about people. And here we are uh, laying out the, uh, the, the, the base. Next one. Here's the bed going in. And the next one. And that's the garden just a year later. And we are producing, you know, we're, the, the farm is, a, you know, we're, we're a little bit different, obviously. Uh, we, we're a no-till farm, that means we never till the soil. Um, we have, uh, we have these uh, areas in between our fields just for growing wildflowers and perennial plants and native plants so that we can keep 
pollinators and beneficial insects in the farm at all time. We have chickens uh, that are in a, a rotating system so that they graze over a piece of land, let that piece of land rest, incorporate their poop, and then we move them on to the next piece of land. We also use that, uh, that chicken manure to make compost. Um, if you heard Lynn talk yesterday, Lynn Fang, she's been our, our compost queen for the last year. And Lynn is just so awesome. Uh, she's a poop queen. And she, she's, been, she's brought in this year something like 8,000 pounds of organic matter to compost at our farm. Just since, I mean, just since January. And she's bringing in horse stable bedding. She's bringing in juice salt, coffee grounds. Uh, uh, food pantry waste, and we're turning that all into fertility. We're identifying that waste as a resource, and you know it's just a flip in your in your mind. You just got to flip that switch and say, this is not trash. This is something that can be used. And that, there's Lynn uh, with her composting team, and the greatest thing about this program has been to see the growth of the people that are involved. So we have a. Uh, we, we do a four-month farmer training program. We take about uh, eight. We take up to eight people at a time, and they learn hands-on how to, you know, how to grow food, how to do something beneficial for their community, how to do beneficial something beneficial for the the land that we're on and the you know the world that we live in, the community that we live in. And after the the the, the best thing has been to see what people go on to do after the farmer training program. This is Alex. And, and her daughter, and this is uh, at her daughter's school, Park Elementary. After Alex finished our farmer training program, she's been taking the skills that she learned and implementing this garden at her, her kids' school. And we had another mom who, who took our training program, and she did the same thing. Now she's working at her kids' school, making the garden for them. And, you know, and there's Lynn, and you can see the compost pile. We have this event every month. We call it Coffee, Compost, and Conversation. And you come, you the the ticket price is some kind of something to compost. So you gotta bring in juice pulp or eggshells or whatever it is. You gotta contribute something to the farm. And we stand around and you know we do this kind of like compost ritual where you introduce yourself and you add something to the compost pile. And we're creating the culture of connection, right? That's what we're doing. We're creating the culture of connection. And now Lynn, I mean. I just want to say something about Lynn, even though I mean, she's not here today, but if you, can, if you can hang out with her, she's really awesome. She's uh, been working up with us for a year, and last year she started uh, composting at our farm, and you know, she was kind of shy, she was still getting new to the ropes and, and you know, learning to communicate with people. And now you see Lynn teach a composting class, and she's just, you know, she's so full of energy, and she really, she, I mean, she's so, uh, she's just into it, you know, and it comes across. And you, when she's into it and she's telling you about it, you're into it. And we, you know, we, just, we, uh, we had a possum die on our farm a few months ago, and she composted it. And now we got the possum skull, and she's going to turn it into like a necklace or a headdress or something. She showed it yesterday. She's awesome. This is, I just want to say. Uh, and this is Noy. This is, Noy is one of my current interns, and, and Noy is so funny, you know, he, he says something, he's like, he's like the, the kid on the kids who say the darndest thing, except he's 28, you know? and he's, he's like, yeah, you know, sometimes I, I feel like, I, sometimes I think about making a smoothie, but then it's so much work to clean it up, and I just go to Jamba Juice instead. And I'm saying, like, and Noy's here at the farm, I'm like, Noy, you know we're, like, working to grow this food. Yeah. That's a lot more work than cleaning a blender. <laughs> and Noy no, had never cooked anything before. He said, he actually told us, he said, he said, uh, you know, when I was growing up, all I knew about food was, here, Noy, food. He never cooked a, a day in his life, never cooked a single meal. And since he's been on the farm, he's coming in, he's like, oh, Swiss chard, man, I didn't know Swiss chard was so good with the garlic chives. And he's cooking. And he's, that means he's cleaning it up too, which is like... <laughs> and then we got uh, Lynn and Mona, uh, sorry, Karen and, and Mona. Karen and Mona are, are on our team right now too. And Karen is thinking about becoming an urban farmer. Lynn is, uh, or sorry, not Lynn, uh, Mona is 
is going to be going to NYU, and she's now doing a she's going to be doing a master's degree in in uh, international development. So it's just amazing to see, you know, this transformation that happens. And it's not just because we're teaching them about farming; we're teaching them about them about connection, and they're starting to understand, like, okay, it doesn't make sense for me to go to Jamba Juice where you know they're shipping oranges from who knows where to here and then blending it up, putting it in a styrofoam cup, and the styrofoam cup is made out of petroleum from somewhere, and it's processed and it's shipped, like, hey, it's a lot easier actually on the whole world if I just make my own damn smoothie. <laughs> and, and like I said, you know, it's not, it's not just the people, it's not just soil, we got our happy chickens, they can roam around, we have a nice, you know, delicious grass for them. And, uh, and then here's the, the wildflowers from our, our hedges here, uh, our hedges in between the fields. So we have butterflies and, and uh, we have we got plenty of bees. There's no pollinator. There's no bee collapse on the farm. We're doing just fine. Um, and and it's just I just like this understanding that this everything is connected together and that and that it all fits together. And and it, the the I think the reason that I'm here is because it's not just be, you know all this stuff we do is not just cute and and cuddly and nice like. What we're doing is actually, the, the craziest thing is that we're running a successful farm. And every week, we are putting out these uh, CSA boxes. So you can, you can uh, sign up with us and, and buy a, sign up for three months. We deliver you, a, or we send, you a, send close to you a, a box of produce. We've got two different sizes. There's a little advertisement right here. Uh, and we have 25 customers. Oh, oh, and then uh, Renee in the back right there. She's gonna be speaking later today. We sell to Renee's store, Daily Organics, in West Adams. We're the primary produce supplier there. Uh, and, and let me give you some. Let me give. Oh, okay. Let me give you some numbers. Here. Yeah, watch the box. Oh yeah, watch the box. Okay. Okay. Oh, so here's what a sample CSA box looks like. Okay. So let's go. So we have 19,000 square feet of land at this farm. Next. We are using, on average, so I have, I have numbers, right? Like Andrew was saying, I got all these numbers. Uh, 17,491 gallons per month. And an average person in LA uses 150 gallons per day. So a family of four, so that's 600 gallons a day. And in a month, what's that? Same amount of water, four people, one house, okay? Same amount of water. So we've, had, we've uh, had 12 farmers go through our training program, and we're harvesting over 1,000 pounds of food every month. Lynn has composted, oh, so this is just food waste. This is not including the horse stable bedding, but Lynn has composted 4,683 pounds of food up until now this year. I can even give it you down to the decimal point. I, took, I left those on. Okay. We're delivering 25 CSA boxes per week and selling to Renee and selling to uh, Pitzer College. And that's over $800 a week in sales. And that's almost $100,000 per acre in sales. Okay. So, We are a nonprofit, but we're we're trying to create a model, okay? Uh, because we're not there yet. I mean, this this number is it looks big, but we have a team of almost six people who are doing this. Uh, oh, yeah, more than that. Team of eight eight people who are who are putting this together. But we're getting there, and we just want to sh you know show people like we think this is possible, uh, and and it is possible because we understand that. It's not a waste of space to plant flowers, and it's not a waste of space to uh, you know to plant trees, and it's not a waste of my time to teach people, and it's not a waste of my time to invite the community into my farm. I got to do all those things because everything is connected. And for my farm to flourish, I have, everything around me has got to flourish. And now. Uh, we just expanded to this new site. This is a, at the Claremont Quaker Friends meeting. They had a lawn 
7,500 square foot lawn they wanted to take out, and they said, if you guys uh, take the lawn out and put in a put in an orchard for us, we'll give you all our lawn rebate money, and you can keep all the fruit for 10 years. Wow. And I said, hell yeah. <laughs> so that's the that's October 2015, and now this is December. Oh, sorry, this is new update. This is current. This is uh, I just took this this weekend. Okay, and here's a few few pictures. Another picture. And we planted uh, 58 trees there so far. The total is going to be 63 when we're done. And in, the, in probably by next year, this orchard will be supplying fruit for our CSA program. And hopefully in, in three or four years, it's going to be supplying a lot of fruit for our CSA program. And this is a public garden. So you can go here anytime. You can walk through here. There's no fences, no gates. Um, we, we will have signs up that say, please don't pick our fruit. But you can definitely go in and hang out. Uh, and, and you know, on, this is a, it's not just an orchard, right? It's an orchard, and the understory is all California native plants. And uh, you, can, you can come and sit there and hang out. It's a water harvesting garden, so you can see the, the swales that are harvesting water off the rooftop. And we have pathways. The, the Quaker meeting is mostly elderly folks, so we put in this decomposed granite pathway so that wheelchairs can go through there. So we're trying to, you know, we design the garden with all those things in mind because we're thinking in connection. So I, want, I also want to invite you all to come out. We're having a grand opening of this garden Saturday, May 14th, and uh, we have some flyers in the back. So just a final thought. We made things like this. We made the suburbs. We made things like this. We made things like this. Now let's start making things like this. Let's start making things like this. Thank you. So just a few other things. Uh, if you want to apply for our farmer training program or you know anyone who wants to do that, the, uh, it's on our, the link is on our website, and you can also sign up to become a Growing Club member. We need the support of a lot more people to keep what we're doing uh, financially sustain sustainable. So if you can uh, spare $10 a month and contribute to the work we're doing, we really appreciate it. We have flyers and all that. And, uh, and do I have time for questions? Yeah, 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 yeah. questions. Uh... Yeah. So the question was about if I had trouble convincing my family to let go of the lawn, and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm lucky. My mom's in the back, and she's my my main you know partner on this. And she's awesome, and she was like, uh, "Take out the lawn, consider it gone." <laughs> Uh, but you know, my dad was not was not really that into it. But you know, I think I think a lot of it, a lot of this uh, change is just showing people that you know, do a little bit, show them that it's cool, and then then kind of inch your way forward, right? Like the I think that's been our entire story. It's just do it, do as much as you can, make it awesome, right? That's the main thing, like. A lot of people have said to me, like, oh, you know, my parents will let me do it, but then I go over and, like, I, I'll see their garden and there's just, it's a mess and there's, you know, this junk everywhere. Like, you know, people want it to be, it's, we're in the city, like, it's got to be a little clean, it's got to be a little organized, it's got to have flowers, you know, it's got to have, it's got to look pretty, make it look pretty. If it looks pretty, people are usually into it. 
when the project started, um, this type of resource didn't exist. But now we exist, so come bring your dad, bring your dad to the potlucks, bring your family. Part of the whole culture of connection that we're trying to build here is to engage family members, engage folks. I spoke with someone this morning and she said, oh, I don't know if I can find a babysitter, but I told her, bring your family, bring everyone. This is what we're about. We're trying to build this community and trying to build these connections. So bring your family, have them talk to us. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, what kind of permitting and regulation process did you go through before you make a modification that you guys developed at the Lakers residence? Yeah, so uh, the farm, she's asked about permitting and zoning for the, uh, the urban farm site. Uh, it, it is in the back of a residential lot, so there's a house in the front and we just occupy the back. Uh, and the permitting process that we went through was we didn't talk to anyone, didn't tell anyone anything, and we did it anyways. And uh, just recently, actually, we, we ended up having to tell the city. And uh, now we are going to be on the zoning committee, because they're redoing their zoning this year. And Pomona is going to be including urban farming in their residential zoning, yes. and we're going to be in that. We're going to be guiding. Yeah. Um, so you our our landlord wanted some kind of written thing from the city saying that it would, you know, that what we're doing was okay because we're since we originally when he when we started the farm. Uh, we weren't having that many people come into the property, but now we're having events and all that stuff, so he just wanted some a little more security that he's not going to get in trouble. Part of the zoning that you're trying to change could be taking more residential I think what they're mainly looking at is including urban ag in residential zoning for properties that are of a certain size. We haven't gotten into a lot of detail yet, so I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe. Uh, I just wanted to just make one small little uh, comment. Um, I heard my son and my future daughter-in-law <laughs> um, say we're trying. We're not trying. We're actually doing it. Uh, we're actually doing it, and we are breaking the rules, and we have to break them, and we're doing all the way. Uh, but yeah, we're doing it and other people are coming behind us and we're getting a following, we're getting noise to noise, how do you say that word? Notoriety. Yeah, so we're cool people. <laughs> Follow us <laughs> and make the changes in your own home because together we can all make this happen. Okay, thank you.